I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, Azerbaijan, oil rich, media poor. We have a special report. A cross border war of words, Iran takes its message onto the airwaves. State funded television shooting itself in the foot again. And a Viagra commercial to remember. Welcome back. Over the past few years, the biggest media story in the world has been about a strategically placed, mainly Muslim country, rich in oil, Iraq. This week, we're devoting our broadcast to another country that's lesser known, but worth watching because it ticks many of those same boxes. Azerbaijan is a former Soviet Republic. Its eight million people sit between Russia and Iran and alongside huge oil deposits under the Caspian Sea. So the country's at the heart of a tug of war between Iran, Russia, and the West. A new pipeline runs from the capital Baku on the Caspian through Georgia to the Turkish port of Jehan. That long piece of pipe is critical to supplying the oil-hungry West with a vast new supply. The crude is now flowing out. Petrodollars have started moving the other way. But when it comes to freedom of the press, Azerbaijan remains trapped in a Soviet-style time warp. Journalists are routinely imprisoned, beaten, even murdered. In the first of two special reports for the Listening Post, Simon Ostrovsky looks at a government crackdown on the media ahead of presidential elections, as well as the lengths that some journalists will go to to get the story out. <laughs> Baku. It's a city transformed by a U.S.-backed oil pipeline that unlocked the riches of the Caspian two years ago and turned Azerbaijan's capital into a boom town. But as the oil flows out and the money flows in, those not happy with President Ilham Aliyev's grip on power and the monopoly on the economy held by those close to him are finding that speaking out too loud is a risky gamble. Instead of pressure on the press decreasing, it actually increased. At one point, there were 10 journalists in prison. Our rights were being trampled, so I announced a hunger strike and sewed my lips together. In 2003, Ilham Aliyev, who's on the left, took over from his father as president, who's on the right. International observers said the election was rigged, and the opposition took to the streets in protest, only to be beaten back by police. In 2005, it was a parliamentary vote deemed unfree and unfair that brought the opposition out into the streets. If you look carefully, you can see me. I was a journalist based here for two and a half years, and I covered the elections for the AFP news agency. As a foreigner, working for a Western media, I didn't face harassment from the authorities. But for local journalists, it's a different story. As the protests in 2003 turned into a riot, police took a break from truncheoning demonstrators to attack a section of Freedom Square that the media had taken up to watch the events unfold. Two years later, for the parliament vote, the authorities decided to issue journalists with blue press vests. The idea was to differentiate members of the media from opposition activists so that the police would know who not to hit. But in the run-up to the elections, a number of journalists were hurt anyway. Elmar Husseinov, the editor of the Critical Monitor magazine, was shot dead in front of his flat in a case that is unsolved to this day. There's another election coming up this year. In October, President Aliyev will stand for a second term. And though his victory is seen here as guaranteed, reporters are bracing for more trouble. Sarah Paulsworth is an activist of the Institute for Reporter Freedom and Safety, which was set up in the aftermath of the parliamentary election. Now we have the presidential elections uh, approaching in October of 2008, and we expect to see an increase in pressure. Of course, like I said, they already have the most critical outspoken journalists in prison, and in the next few months we expect to see more uh, lawsuits against journalists, more journalists probably getting imprisoned, getting fined, getting threatened, and hopefully not, but there's always the risk that somebody could be injured, attacked, or even murdered like Omar Husseinov was. 
Journalists accuse the authorities of abusing libel laws and even tax legislation to put pressure on critical publications. In 2006, Rafik Taghi and his editor were sentenced to jail time for inciting religious hatred. Their crime? They argued in an opinion piece that Islam had hindered democratic development. They were released by a presidential pardon in December, along with three others, but four of the most critical journalists remain behind bars. Sakit Mirza got three years. Ainullah Fatulayev was sentenced to eight and a half years. Musvik Husseinov received six. Ganimat Zahidov's trial isn't over yet. They're all behind bars now? Yes, behind bars now. This reporter accused the interior minister of corruption. He was thrown in jail on a libel charge and took an extreme step to draw attention to his plight. In July, when I was in the 14th prison colony, I sewed my lips together and announced a hunger strike because they wouldn't let us have newspapers. When I announced the hunger strike, I made the demand that they give us access to press, and I wanted to be able to write my thoughts in the newspapers. This is allowed by law. After 17 days, we made a deal. They gave me the papers, and I unstitched my mouth and ended the strike. I wanted to find out why so many journalists were being shunted in and out of Azerbaijani prisons. So I asked Ali Karimli, the leader of the Popular Front Opposition Party. It was his demonstrations that were dispersed during the elections. In the last few years, the Azeri authorities have earned huge amounts of cash from the sale of oil. There is no transparency in Azerbaijan of the management of the oil funds, and the corruption of the authorities has spread everywhere. Independent newspapers and media organizations are trying to follow the money to see how it's being spent, where it's being stolen. This irritates the authorities. That's why in the last two years, the repression of journalists has increased. But according to Ali Ahmadov, who is President Aliyev's deputy in the ruling Yeni Azerbaijan party, the imprisonment of journalists is not a free press issue. Those three journalists who are behind bars, they are not there because they wrote something or are having problems as journalists. They ended up there only because they broke the law. In 2006, Azerbaijan's most popular private television network, ANS, was pulled from the air in midstream for the fourth time since its inception in 1990. Officials said the reasons were licensing irregularities and unpaid fines, not its critical line. It has since reopened, but the effect has been a softening of its editorial line. Zamina Aliyeva, who hosts the channel's flagship investigative program, would not admit that the channel has lost any of its edge. But she conceded that investigative journalism was becoming a thing of the past in this former Soviet Republic. Our station was closed last year just because we were telling the truth. Justice was our priority, so observers say the genre of investigative journalism is being lost. She was working on a story about how dozens of kindergartens around the country were being closed down after the president signed a controversial decree. These teachers now feared losing their jobs. Doesn't the person who wrote the decree know all of this? They are mocking us. It's been over a week since Zamina asked the Education Ministry to respond to the results of her investigation, and she still hasn't heard back. As with so much else in Azerbaijan, her story will have to make do without the help of the authorities. Our Global Village Voices now with their views on the Azerbaijan story. I think that um, the international community has turned a blind eye um, to a lot of things that are happening in Azerbaijan in terms of democracy in general and abuse of human rights, but uh, the media in particular, the international response to the mass arrests and the crackdowns and shutting, of news, shutting down of newspapers has been you know, practically non-existent. We're always recruiting new Global Village voices for our broadcast. Email us at listeningpost at aljazeera.net and we'll see if we can get you on the air via your webcam or your camera phone. Time now for Listening Post News Bites, starting out with a story on a country in Azerbaijan's neighborhood. TV coverage of next week's presidential elections in Armenia has come in for criticism from opposition parties there who say the state-run Armenian public television is far from balanced in its reporting. 
Citing coverage of a recent pro-opposition rally, they accused the public TV channel of misrepresenting support for candidate Ter Petrosian. The channel showed an almost empty square where a few people were standing when, according to the opposition, a substantial number of supporters had actually turned out. Charges have been dropped against two Turkish cartoonists accused of insulting President Abdullah Gül. Musa Kart and Zafir Timujin faced up to four years in prison after lampooning the president in the Turkish daily Cumhuriyet last November. They were accused of breaking a Turkish law called Article 299, which makes it a criminal offense to insult the president. President Gül claimed he had no involvement in the case, adding, I look at these things about myself as humor. To be honest, I just laugh. Coming up after the break, the propaganda battle being fought over the Azerbaijan-Iran border.